mason jar. Demineralized water. Gas burner. Fire. Patience. If this is the first time you are seeing a video with this name, be aware that this isn't my idea and it isn't new. It's a sort of gimmicky high school chemistry trick. And the name boiling water with ice is total clickbait because it makes it sound as if you're going to boil the water from ambient temperatures using ice. But step one is always, well, boil the water the way you'd usually boil the water. Okay, screw it. Enough patience. More gas. Temperature check, 93 degrees. So we've got a gentle boil going. Now I'm going to pop a piece of cling film over the top. The idea is that I've been heating up to the boil for quite a long time and hopefully the water vapor that forms has displaced most of the air in the jar. If there's air in the jar, this doesn't work. The contents of the jar need to be entirely or at least almost entirely water, no air. The cling film makes it a little more difficult to pull air into the jar in these last few moments. And then I pierce the cling film. I let it go a little bit longer to purge more air out if there is any, and then I put the lid on and switch off the gas. Now this is where the ice comes in. This works really well with a mason jar because the metallic lid conducts heat really well. Look what happens when I place ice on top of the lid. Lo and behold, it starts to boil. Right, so what's happening here? Let's go back to the point at which we put the lid on the jar. Just before we put the lid on, the water had been boiling at atmospheric pressure. That means we have a pressure above the water of one atmosphere, that's the water vapor, and the temperature of the water that corresponds to this pressure is the boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. Then we stop heating the liquid, screw on the lid, and we trap this one atmosphere, 100 Celsius, in the jar. The contents of the jar are 100% water, nothing else. Go to the point at which you place the ice on the lid. The water vapor is saturated, which means removing any heat will cause the water vapor to condense. By placing ice on top of the lid, I'm causing water vapor to form droplets on the underside of the lid. Now the density of the liquid droplets is roughly 960 kilograms per cubic meter. Compare that to the density of the exact same molecules when they're in the vapor phase. That's only about 0.6 kilograms per cubic meter. That means the volume, the amount of space that these molecules take up, it's reduced by a factor of 1,600. This reduction in volume causes the pressure in the jar to drop. The pressure is no longer one atmosphere, it's lower. Now you need to understand something that was explained to me by a steam trap salesman and it really stuck with me. He asked a really simple question. He asked, what do you call water at one atmosphere and 101 degrees Celsius? The answer is you call it steam. Liquid water at 101 degrees does not exist at a pressure of one atmosphere. The maximum temperature liquid water can exist is the boiling point. And if that pressure is one atmosphere, that maximum temperature is 100 degrees. So now it's your turn. What do you call water at 100 degrees and a pressure less than one atmosphere? 
That's right, you call it steam. You do not get liquid at 100 degrees if the pressure is lower than one atmosphere. But it isn't as if all of the liquid suddenly disappears. All that happens is a small portion of the liquid boils off and that boiling takes energy. The energy it gets from the liquid. So the removal of that energy causes the temperature of the liquid to drop. The entire system sorts itself out so that the amount of liquid that boils off is enough to remove the amount of energy required so that the temperature always corresponds to the boiling point at whatever pressure is in the jar. In other words, you always have the vapor pressure corresponding to the liquid temperature and the system is always saturated. Now to demonstrate this, I tried doing the same thing with the thermocouple and pressure gauge attached to the lid of the jar. The gauge I use measures vacuum, which is correct because we said the pressure will drop below atmospheric. That's why the boiling point drops below 100 degrees. Ideally, we should read the saturation, temperature and pressure as can be found in a steam table or those results you get from the Antoine equation. But it was actually incredibly difficult to get the jar to seal. The lowest pressure I could get to was about minus 0.4 bar and I was definitely pulling in air. No amount of epoxy, silicon and PTFE tape was doing the trick. Besides that, I'm not totally certain that the jar I bought in a regular store can withstand the almost near vacuum that would result. At 20 degrees, the vapor pressure is only about 2 kilopascals absolute. That means that the gauge would have to read minus 0.99 bar all the way over here. I should also warn you that the jar can break when heating and you'll end up with glass and hot water everywhere. If you plan on doing this, it's best to wear glasses. I measured that I had 153 grams of water inside a jar whose volume is 590 milliliters. Since neither the mass nor the volume can change with the lid closed, this means that I have a constant volume and a constant density process where the density is roughly 260 kilograms per cubic meter. If we look at a pressure enthalpy chart, the line showing a constant density of 260 is this line over here. You can see from 100 degrees, the normal boiling point, down to the temperature in my kitchen, this line basically lies right on top of the saturated liquid line. This simply means that despite the jar being less than half full of liquid water, almost, but not quite, 100% of the molecules are in the liquid phase. It's just that the vapor density is so low, very few molecules are needed to take up a heck of a lot of space. Remember that factor of 1600 I mentioned earlier? Cool, huh?